Happy New Year and welcome to the River Online Sermon. I know that 2020 has been a really difficult year and unlike anything probably any of us have faced before, um, but I'm thankful for the ways that God has provided in the midst of this. My family and I spent some time uh, just uh, um, on New Year's Day thinking through some of the ways that God has blessed us even in the midst of the hard times that we've had. And so we are thankful for that. And as we look ahead to this new year, to 2021, um, we want to kick things off right with prayer. And let me pray for our time uh, together as we get started today. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you for the ways you have provided this past year. And even though it's been a tough year, uh, we know that you are God. And we give you honor and glory. And we pray that you would bless us as we come into 2021, that our eyes would be focused upon you. May you help us to be attended to you in your word now as we look into your uh, into this passage for today. And I pray specifically for me that you would help me to be attentive to what you want to say through me and that you would receive all the honor and glory for this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you know that according to a survey done about six years ago by Pew Research, uh, that about 55% of all Americans surveyed said that they pray every day, even those with no aff re religious affiliation whatsoever? Um, and 31% uh, said that they pray several times a day. And only, only about 23% said that they pray seldom or never. According to another survey, uh, this one uh, done around the same time, but by a different group, it was done by Lifeway Research, uh, they found that 82% of those surveyed said that they pray about family and friends. And 74% said that they pray about the problems that they're facing. And 54% said that they, in prayer, give thanks for all that they have received. And 42% pray about their own sin. And only about 37% said that they pray about God's greatness. Interesting, right? So I want you to ponder this question. How might recognizing the greatness of God impact our prayers? Prayer and the greatness of God. That's our focus for today. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah chapter 6. Now, if you were at the river in December or if you receive our emails or Facebook posts, you know that we are beginning uh, today, we are beginning a 40-day uh, prayer focus um, as we start out 2021. Now, this is part of a larger movement within our denomination, the Christian and Missionary Alliance, and our national office has made a lot of resources available, including weekly emails and, and devotionals that are available for you to do uh, each day of the week. And each week has a theme. And for the first week, the theme is the attributes of God. Now, one of the resources that our national office provided is sermon outlines from some of our leaders. Now, I personally do not like using other people's material to preach from, uh, but I do like the idea of preaching on the same passage as other pastors are preaching on today across our country. And so while I will not be using the outlines they provided, I will be preaching from the same passage. So today we'll be taking a look at the holiness of God from the first eight verses of Isaiah chapter six. Let's begin with a little context. So um, what do you know about Isaiah? So we know that he is a son of Amos, and we know that he was both a prophet and a priest who served in Judah during the reigns of about four different kings. His book is well known for all of the, the wonderful prophecies about the coming Messiah, and he is quoted more often in the New Testament than all of the other Old Testament prophets combined. So let's pick things up in chapter 6 with verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Okay, so first, let's notice the context of this being, this happening during the year of King Uzziah's death. So he died sometime around 740 BC after reigning as king for 52 years in Judah. He was a good king and during his reign there was a time of relative peace and prosperity. But it was also a time when Assyria was gaining strength. It was amassing power kind of on the borders, like, like getting close there. So the idea of Uzziah dying probably set up a context where the people of Judah were concerned with what Uzziah's death might mean for the future of the kingdom, especially with Assyria seemingly being so threatening nearby. 
But not only does that help us understand uh, maybe the mentality of the people, it also provides a context, uh, not a context, like a, a contrast with between the image of Uzziah on his throne, this king of Judah, compared to the heavenly king that Isaiah sees in this vision. Now, what's a vision? So basically, a vision is a way that God has spoken to his people over t at t different times by letting them see and hear things kind of like in a dream, but while they were awake. Now, as we consider these verses, let's try to picture what's being said here. Now, that's kind of hard to do because there's a limited amount of information and, and it's a vision, so it's maybe a little cloudy, like trying to express what you saw in a dream. Um, but let's, um, as we talk, as we look into this, let's try and picture this image, try to get an idea of what's happening here. So what do we see in verse one? Notice that it mentions that Isaiah saw the Lord. What do we mean when we say the word Lord? So this is the Hebrew word Adonai, which means Lord. And, and when, when we tend to define the idea of Lord, uh, it seems to suggest someone who is an authority or power over others. Now, that's not exactly a name for God. This is more of like a description of, of, of for who God is and what he does. It's, um, it's, it's like he is Lord. He's, he's, he's the one who has all authority and power um, over all. It says that Isaiah saw the Lord. So why might that be a big deal, that, that he saw the Lord? Throughout the Old Testament, we are reminded that no one can see the Lord and live, right? Uh, so the idea that Isaiah saw the Lord, even imperfectly in a vision, is a pretty big deal. Now, remember that, because we're going to get into that again in a little bit. Now, this vision seems to suggest a heavenly throne room. How do you picture this throne room? Are you getting an image in your mind? And notice that not only is the Lord on a throne, his throne seems to be high and lifted up. It's elevated in some way, which makes sense because his throne is above all other earthly thrones, right? He's not just a Lord. He is the Lord of Lords. Uh, he's the King of Kings. We can see the contrast here between King Uzziah and his throne over Judah compared to the one who sits on this heavenly throne, high and lifted up above all else. Then it mentions this idea of the train of his robe filling the temple. That's kind of interesting, right? A little bit of a different kind of image, hard to picture maybe. He's so, but I think I get the idea that he is so majestic and awesome that even the train or hem of his robe fills the temple. It suggests the, the greatness of the Lord and speaks to his regal or kingly nature. And we need to understand too that Isaiah is probably running up against the insufficiency of words. Like he doesn't even have the words to express what he's seeing. The image itself is so overwhelming. God is so far greater than he could possibly explain that his words are not enough to describe his glory. And in verse two, he mentions seraphim. So what are seraphim and how in the world do we picture them? Now this is kind of difficult because this word for seraphim is a word that is used only twice in the Bible, and both times are here in these eight verses. And the word comes from a root word that means like to burn. And it suggests a translation of maybe burning ones. The root of the word is used elsewhere, both here in Isaiah as well as in um, the book of Numbers, uh, to speak of fiery serpents. And so some actually, I think, picture or, or get the image maybe of like some dragon-like kind of creatures here that are on fire or, or maybe some fiery angels. Well, you can picture what you want, but just I, I get this idea of some, something pretty imposing. Um, but notice also that not only are they burning, but they also have these six wings. And notice what they're doing with those wings. With four of their wings, they're covering themselves. Uh, their faces and their feet. Why? So I believe that this is due to them being in the presence of the glory of God. It's, it's like servants bowed down before their masters, covering themselves in, in his presence. And, and that's kind of what I get from this. Is that God's glory and holiness causes them to do so. And notice that they're continually crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So what does it mean that God is holy? That's hard for us to, to fully grasp, but 
basically holy means set apart, uh, sacred, um, distinct. It means that he is completely untouched by sin. It means that he is uncorrupted in every way, completely pure in, in all that he is and in all that he does and even the motives behind what he does. He is separate. He is distinct. He is other. And do you notice that they use the word holy three times? That suggests emphasis. It speaks of, of the perfection of his holiness. Now, what about how, that, how they say that the whole earth is full of his glory? What do you make of that idea? So glory refers to the beauty and splendor of who God is. Like his greatness is on display for all the world to see, and even the entire world itself cannot contain it. Also notice that um, the worship of these seraphim, uh, they're, they're, what they're doing is just simply proclaiming his holiness back and forth over and over and over again. The holiness of God. So let me ask this question. Why in speaking about God's glory and trying to emphasize his glory, trying to talk about his glory, do they constantly refer to his holiness? Why not other attributes of his? Why is it just holy, holy, holy? It's a good question, right? So I think they are pointing out over and over again God's otherness. That God is so far above and separated from everything else that you see how glorious he is. Okay, so with all that in mind, how's your picture forming? Is it coming together? Let's add verses 4 and 5. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So what do you picture in verse 4? So here we see the voice of him who calls shaking the foundations of the earth, shaking the thresholds. And this reminds me of what we see back when the Lord appears uh, to Moses on the mountain back in the book of Exodus. Maybe you remember that story. There was thunder and lightning and smoke and fire and the mountain itself trembled at the presence of God. Why is Isaiah then responding the way he does in verse 5? So we, we see him coming into the presence of the Lord, that, that everything is, is doing, all this is going on with his picture, and he says, woe is me. Why is that his response? So um, I think about how Isaiah, probably throughout his life, has recognized God as being holy and separate. He would know of the time in, uh, in Exodus that we referred to earlier where where. Um, um, God met with Moses on the mountain and even the entire mountain, even the base of the mountain itself was set aside and that the people could not even touch the base of the mountain or they would be killed uh, because it was because of God's holiness and his presence there. Remember, nobody in the Old Testament was able to approach the Lord. Moses came close, but when he was asked, when he asked to see God's glory, God put him in the cleft of a rock and covered him with his hand and then passed by proclaiming who he was and then lifted his hand to God so that Moses could simply see God's back. No one saw God in all his glory and lived. Yet here in this vision, Isaiah saw the Lord. Now, I don't think that this is just expressing that he is afraid of dying. I also think that coming into the light of God's glory caused Isaiah to see even more clearly his own unholiness. So he cries, woe is me. Uh, not um, that, like he's not worthy of being in the Lord's presence. He realizes that, that um, in coming into God's presence, Isaiah brings all of his sin. And, and it's, it's, it's like he, he taints the very picture that we are seeing here. Like his presence taints this and, and, uh, as he comes into God's holy presence and all of his glory. And, and he encapsulates this whole idea of uncleanness that he has with the idea of having unclean lips and coming from a people of unclean lips. Which leads then to a response. Let's take a look at what happens next, beginning with verse 6. 
Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. So now one of the seraphim goes and gets a burning coal and touches it to Isaiah's lips. What's that all about? So elsewhere in scripture, we see the idea of fire having uh, being used for refining and purifying. And verse 7 suggests that this coal is effective in atoning for Isaiah's sins and that through this, God has dealt with his sin and made him clean. Okay, so you, how is your picture coming? Is it continuing to fill out this idea of this throne room and God's holiness and, and Isaiah's uncleanness and the, the cleansing that happens and, and all of that? Let's see what happens next. Um, and Isaiah's response in verse 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. So first of all, you notice the Trinitarian aspect of this verse? So the doctrine of the Trinity states that God exists eternally in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. Notice in this verse, we see the Lord saying, Who shall I send and who will go for us. That suggests both singular and plural, I and us. One God, three persons. I just think that's kind of cool. Now, um, what is the voice of the Lord then asking? So the Lord is asking for someone who is willing to go with the message of the Lord, to go from the holiness of this moment, to the, this place, this the glory of God, uh, to a people who are not holy, and to bring a message for them. And Isaiah responds, here I am, send me. What do you think of that response? It speaks of obedience and a recognition of the importance of the message and a desire to be used by the Lord and a recognition even of responsibility. This is such a good lesson for us, such a good reminder as, as we see God's holiness and receive from him the work that he does in us, that we have a message then to take to a world that also needs that message. Okay, so we have this all this whole picture, this beautiful picture of the throne room and, and the seraphim and, and the holiness of God and his glory and um, how he deals with Isaiah and gives him this purpose and, and all of that. With all that we have in this picture, what do you take from this? What does this mean for you? What do you, what do you get from this? I think for me, the thing that stands out from this vision is Isaiah's response of woe. I believe that when we truly see the Lord in all of his glory and his holiness, um, that that causes us to come face to face with our own uncleanness. As Christians, we have been forgiven from our sin. We've been declared righteous. He has dealt with us. But we know that we are still far from holy. Even though he has placed us in this position of holiness, that we still have stuff. And the more that I come to know the holiness and glory of God, the more I get to know him and see him more clearly and abide in him, it leads me also to more clearly recognize my own sinfulness. The more I see his glory, the more I realize that I still fall short. But that's not a bad thing. Because I also see the, in this the fullness of God's grace. He has saved me from my sin uh, but he also desires to complete the work that he has begun in my life. Notice how God responds to Isaiah's woe by reaching out and dealing with his sin, refining him with fire and using him as a messenger. God wants to refine us as well. He has dealt with our sin and brought us salvation, but he's also looking to refine and transform and sanctify us completely pulling away, peeling away all the layers of sin and, and, and our old self that still remain. And that leads me to want to be in a position of surrender to my Lord, fully available to receive all that he wants to do in me. And then when it comes to prayer, spending time reflecting on the Lord's glory and his holiness holiness and who he is helps me to be in a position of surrender and humility as I approach him. 
seeing my need for his ongoing work in my life and in this world, recognizing that we need this Lord. We need his work. I need his work in my life. I need his work in this world, that I want his kingdom to come and his will to be done in me and in all that I see. Especially as we come out of 2020 and head forth to 2021, we need the Lord. Seeing his holiness and his glory is the perfect place for us to begin in prayer. We need you, Lord. We need you. I need you. With that in mind, let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are glorious. You are mighty. You are holy. You are perfect. You are good. And your glory is more than I could ever imagine or express, and I, I praise you. And your glory and your holiness also makes me recognize my need for you. Lord, as we come into 2021, I pray for more of you in my life, for, for you to continue to refine and transform me and get rid of the gunk that still remains. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Transform my life. Help me to be becoming more like you. Sanctify me fully. And Lord, may your kingdom come and may your will be done in my life. And Lord, for this world, we need more of you, Lord. We are lost. We are a people of unclean lips. We need your glory and your holiness. May you work. May you reign. May your kingdom come. May your will be done here as it is in heaven, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite all of you to join with us on this 40 days of prayer. We need this as we start off this 2021. Let's spend time each day seeking the Lord together this year. And if you're not receiving these resources, if you want to get more, then please do contact us, email us, and uh, we will make sure that you get on that list. Thank you.